Thank you very much, Melanie, for um, the invitation and also to the Goethe Institute and HKW. It's a real privilege to be here. I'm just going to do a little media. Switching. What kind of metaphor is the cloud as a means of visualizing the problem of data? To start with, clouds are evanescent, natural, changeable, predominantly benign, transcendent in their relation to the heavenly realm, etc., etc. So the cloud is a kind of beautiful, poetic figure. In the case of my cloud, for which I'm showing you a, an advertisement, a, a way of um, storing information in your own little private meteorological world, um, there's the additional dimension of property, of exclusive access. Both of these aspects, the natural and the individual, or what C.B. McPherson called possessive individualism, suggest a romantic solution to the question of how to give shape to the vast sublime landscape of information. And here I'm just showing you a John Constable Cloud study to give a sense of how um, the notion of the romantic is founded both in individual perception and a kind of sublime um, spectatorship of uh, nature. Of course, this meteorological metaphor hides as much as it captures, namely the extensive hardware necessary to create the evanescent effect of the cloud what Benjamin Bratton has, has called uh, the idea of the stack, the kind of layered uh, technological apparatus or infrastructure that's necessary for the kind of evanescent um, weather that we think of as um, data or information to persist. What interests me about the cloud as both a metaphor and a technology is the ratio or gradient it establishes between a determinant form and elasticity. Of course, clouds are known for being changeable. They're constantly moving. Their configuration is changing. I want to describe this quality of, of change, perpetual change, with a rather old-fashioned art historical term, the plastic or plasticity, which once the, the plastic once described um, any kind of visual formation, any kind of visual forming. The cloud, I want to suggest, opens to the question of the plasticity of information. And here is one of the many maps of, of the internet, which I always find um, distinctly uninformative, but also, in this case, very much resembling a cloud. What I think is quite interesting about these questions of the plasticity of information with regard to our interest in art um, is the way that art itself, I would argue, since the moment of conceptual, um, conceptualism in the, in the late 1960s, has, has been devoted to um, what I'd like to call the plasticity of information. And I hope that will become clear in the course of my remarks. But first, let me say a few um, very basic layman's um, d definitions about the cloud. These two images are screen grabs from a promotional video that is on the website of Amazon's EC2, which is one of the largest cloud services in the world. It may be the largest, but I think that that changes daily. Um, the EC here stands for Elastic Compute, um, and its qualities include the following. Elastic computing or cloud computing imagines infrastructure as a service as opposed to a durable good. Therefore, it's more like a utility than um, a kind of hard possession. And here, uh, again, I've taken these out of a sequence, but you notice that the servers there have cobwebs on them. Um, it's a kind of old-fashioned idea that there, there would be some kind of physical infrastructure as opposed to the cloud which floats effortlessly above. 
Um, infrastructure is therefore a service that is delivered to the individual. And what's particularly important about it is that it's both scalable, it can be drawn upon in any scale from the tiny to the enormous, and it's flexible. Um, like a utility such as electricity, you use as much electricity as you need. And importantly, it's enabled through the internet. But also, um, the notion of the cloud as my cloud, as um, an individual surface, uh, service, pardon me, um, I think serves to tame the amorphousness of data by molding it to the user's needs. It's my cloud. The template for information's plasticity, therefore, is me. I'm the one who shapes information. Self-possession equals individual access. In this lecture, my goal is to look more critically at the question of how information may be shaped and how it relates to property claims, particularly property claims over oneself and one's image, and how this relates to political forms of freedom, which, is, which are often rooted, I will argue, according to you know, many political um, scientists, in the notion of an inalienable right to oneself and one's behavior, one's freedom. My assumption is that such shapes of information are both deeply aesthetic and deeply political. And here again is one of those um, moments when art and politics can come together. They're aesthetic in the rather simple colloquial sense that flows of information are composed and not formless. We shouldn't let the notion of a cloud lead us to believe that information isn't controlled in various specific kinds of plastic formations. And of course, it's political, um, the notion of uh, shaping information, in the sense that territories of data are determined, like geopolitical territories, by differential capacities of mobility, by inclusions and exclusions, points of access and points of concentration. And here, having just got off several planes, um, I thought of um, one way of thinking this differential degree of mobility is the imagination of a route um, map. For instance, Lufthansa, you could, any global airline could be used. Um, this notion of a kind of frictionless possibility, um, which is sort of like a cloud, I mean, those lines covering the world are a bit like a meteorological map. But then there is the very um, controlled circulation through different checkpoints that we're all aware of in travel, and that, of course, um, are quite different depending upon the passport one carries, the color of one's skin, um, even perhaps gender. These differential um, point, uh, degrees of access, of mobility, um, are what Deleuze might call a landscape of control rather than the pastoral landscape suggested by the cloud. As I've mentioned, I find the, um, the term plasticity effective in this regard. It encompasses three different registers, all of which I think are very helpful and important. First, a now obsolete designation of the plastic arts, as I mentioned before. So it has to do with um, with forming, um, how form works, the science of form, let's say. Second, the uh, elasticity of plastic as a material is really important, I think, in terms of a metaphor for data, including its capacity to be recycled. And third, um, in the biological context, plasticity is a capacity for adaptation. And I think, in fact, that if we think about form as a perpetual um, force or uh, tendency toward adaptation. It will help us to think about um, how information circulates, the kinds of templates and forms that describe that. Commercially, of course, the plasticity of information is exploited through data mining, which is premised on producing new value by perceiving patterns in very large sets of data. And this is 
This is another really important aspect of the plasticity of information, that its capacity to be formed, its quality of being like plastic, the material, and like plasticity in biology, its changeability, its capacity to adopt different patterns, is in fact a new form of capital, a new form of value, um, a new form of property, in fact, um, which is very difficult to understand and to control. But before engaging in the questions of data's plasticity more generally and socially, I want to back up a little bit and build a kind of register um, within the history of art uh, that corresponds to these questions. I've already mentioned that I believe that conceptual art is an art of information plasticity. And I want to say what I mean by this because I think it goes a bit beyond um, the notion that conceptual art is um, the language of bureaucracy, as Benjamin H. D. Buchloh famously and importantly argued, um, that it's a kind of administrative language transposed to art. While that's true, I think it only takes us to a certain point. Um, it doesn't allow for the kind of complexity that information um, creates as a landscape or a territory. Whoops. Um, here is one of the initial uh, works of conceptual art, which is probably familiar to almost everyone, if not everyone in the audience. Lawrence Wiener's book, Statements of 1968, where various actions were described, which he famously, um, in a statement of 1969, um, argued uh, could be constructed or not. It didn't matter. His, um, his so-called uh, um, statement of intent runs as follows. It's on the screen, but I'll just read through it. One, the artist may construct the work. Two, the work may be fabricated. Three, the work need not be built each being equal and consistent with the intent of the artist. The decision as to the condition rests with the receiver upon the occasion of receivership. In other words, the work exist, exists in potential like a form of credit, but the credit is guaranteed by the name of the artist, by the artist's intention. The name Lawrence Wiener controls the artwork's circulation. Whether the decision is his or not is irrelevant the name guarantees the value of that circulation. I'm going to try to argue um, through this idea of how the individual is tied to information, which is parallel to the idea of my cloud um, as we move through. But first, to give a sense of the plasticity of information and how various different registers of um, data and meaning are articulated together in works of conceptual art and works of more contemporary art, which I'll end up by talking about. Let me look at another very famous work, Hans Hacke's Schapolsky et al., Manhattan Real Estate Holdings, A Real-Time Social System as of May 1, 1971. This work is probably familiar to you as well. Um, what Hans Hacke did was he researched a series of tenements in New York City um, that were owned by dummy corporations that were all tied back to one family, to one name, Schapolsky. And he documented these buildings by photographing um, the tenements, then listing the different uh, corporations through which ownership was masked, and finally by creating a kind of diagram that um, mapped ownership. Now, I just want to make a very simple point about this work right now rather than going into a deep um, interpretation of it. And that is that at least two kinds of information are articulated with one another here. There is a logic of finance, and there's a logic of real, real estate, of territory. We could also think about logics of the diagram, of the photograph, of the text, etc. But what I want to, to stress here is that we can't just call this the language of bureaucracy or administration, because what we have are two different layers of data that are intersecting with one another in a particular way. The diagram becomes a cloud, in fact, um, which articulates a shape of ownership. Um, what, this, what he calls this work is a real-time social system. 
it is a form of plasticity which has to do with, um, with financial ownership and real property and how they map unevenly upon one another. Now my reason for looking at, at this is in order to build a model for thinking about how information, um, different registers of information are articulated together into a certain kind of form or plasticity. In um, the movie Citizen Four, which um, uh, again, a very familiar work, which came out last year, uh, Laura Poitras' film about Edward Snowden's um, revelations. In fact, a kind of um, almost enactment of those revelations in real time of the NSA um, documents. There are at least three different um, kinds of uh, network or form that are articulated together. The first is a very narrow band, the dark net from which the dark and my um, dark clouds uh, come, uh, of encrypted communication with which um, Snowden initially was able to contact um, Quadras. Um, so there's a very narrow band, a very protected and policed and, you know, at times illegal, um, depending upon uh, you know the kind of um, judgments that are made. The Silk Road, which was a, a dark net um, internet uh, uh, system, was recently found illegal, as I'm sure you know. So there was there is a very narrow bandwidth of the dark net. Then there is the physical mobility of Snowden moving from Hawaii to a hotel room in um, Honolulu, in, uh, Honolulu, in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, what is so amazing about the movie, if you've seen it, is that it's almost entirely filmed in the claustrophobic confines of a hotel room. So on the one hand, you have this sort of stealthy information network that comes out of nowhere. On the other hand, you have this claustrophobic physical space that is also you know, a space of mobility, a hotel. And then there's the absolute openness of the WikiLeaks, um, uh, I mean, pardon me, of the, um, of the NSA documents as they were put onto, onto the Guardian newspaper website. So what we have here is another example of a formation in which different registers of information articulate with one another, different degrees of mobility, some physical, some virtual, some open to everyone, some very narrowly focused, which I think is very different from this idea of a cloud as a sort of um, universal or consistent substance of fluffy um, uh, beauty. One of Snowden's most emphatic points in the film was that he wanted to remain anonymous so that his disclosures regarding NSA surveillance programs would not be eclipsed with, by fascination with his personality as a whistleblower. And this is one of the main reasons, I mean, one, if one were cynical about it, one could also say he wanted to try to evade capture, but I don't think, I think he was rather practical about the fact that he would eventually be, um, you know, discovered that he would never um, uh, go undetected. But this concern that the story would be about him as opposed to the information, I think points to the ways in which I've already tried to say that my cloud, for instance, is focused around a kind of um, privacy, uh, a kind of individualization. So here, this is really a no my cloud rather than a no cloud itself. Um, what Snowden wanted to do was to unlink um, the possessive, the, the claim of property from information. Michel Foucault articulates this mechanism of the relation between um, an author uh, or a personality and um, information, 
brilliantly in his important essay of 1969, What is an Author, which is often associated um, almost without distinction with Roland Barthes' um, text, uh, The Death of the Author, which uh, leads to the, the importance of the reader as the interpreter of the text. I would argue that Foucault gives us a really dramatically different notion of um, the function, what he called the author function, that has nothing to do with the death of the author, but rather its reactivation um, in a kind of information economy. He, two points emerge in this essay that I think are very important. The first is, I would argue that he, he asserts that the author serves to de delineate the plasticity of the text. In other words, the function of the author is to shape the text. Now what he, he, says, he says the following along these lines. The name of the author remains at the contours of texts, separating one from the other, defining their form, and characterizing their mode of existence. It points to the existence of certain groups of discourse and refers to the status of the discourse within a society and culture. His famous example is that, for instance, um, the, la the, the laundry lists or the notes on the refrigerator or whatever version uh, of a particular time of a famous author, let's say Marx, would not be included within his texts. In other words, um, and there are, very, there, you know, there are debates all the time about uh, bringing out texts that authors didn't want to publish during their lifetime, but that are authorized posthumously by executors, etc. What Foucault is arguing here is that the function of the author is the function of shaping a discourse. And I think that this is really extremely important um, given how information circulates now. The second thing that, the second point that Foucault makes in this, um, this essay, well, there are many points, but the second thing that I want to draw out is that the author is a mechanism of circulation. Not only does the author sort of shape the text or the discourse, but the author um, is a motive force in circulating it. He writes the following, and this goes to what, the example that I mentioned a moment ago. A private letter may have a signatory, but it does not, doesn't have an author. A contract can have an underwriter, but not an author. And similarly, an anonymous poster attached to a wall may have a writer, but he cannot be an author. In this sense, the function of an author is to characterize the existence, circulation, and operation of certain discourses within a society. In other words, the author allows certain kinds of mobility within texts to occur. The author then, as I'm trying to argue um, through Foucault's uh, essay, um, functions in two ways relevant to my argument. One is that he or she delineates the plasticity of a text or discourse. And second, he or she helps to delineate the plasticity of its circulation. According to this updated reading then, the author doesn't die in the age of information, but rather is transformed into a profile. And this is what I really want to argue, is that the author in our moment, and I think Foucault, you know, at the same moment that conceptual art was, was um, emerging, Foucault wrote this essay, and I think he really somehow put his finger on something very important, which is that discourse requires an author function, which is very different from a biological, psychological person. Um, it's a profile. And what Snowden, of course, was afraid of was exactly um, what eventually happened, is that the disclosures became associated with him as a certain kind of profile, a certain kind of uh, type, a whistleblower. The profile is one of the most common forms of information plasticity. It's the equivalent of mimesis in painting, and it is one of the biggest products of data mining in virtually every realm of life. Let me just run through these briefly. They're quite familiar, I think. First of all, in terms of politics or terror, ethnic profiling is a way of controlling and securing cultures in perpetual motion. 
and um, has led police in national and urban and um, municipal contexts, as well as international um, entities to um, develop profiles of um, people that they want to watch and control more carefully. In terms of labor, um, certain nationalities um, and genders, such as, for instance, Chinese women for certain kinds of um, in, uh, manufacturing work, or Indian English-speaking people in call centers, are profiled in terms of um, the characteristics that they possess in a global economy um, for providing certain kinds of services and labor. In terms of capital, you can't see this diagram, but it's just there as a, um, as a kind of placeholder. Uh, data collection and data mining have been enormously profitable for corporations in terms of um, marketing and um, being one step ahead, uh, real-time broadcasting of what people actually want to buy. And finally, of course, profiling is one of our greatest pleasures um, in terms of creating profiles on every possible um, site from dating sites to social media to travel sites, et cetera, et cetera. A profile is both a subject and an object. It can be owned or possessed by the biological person linked to it, such as a Facebook profile, or it may be expropriated from her, as when um, police are profiling or marketers are profiling based on information that we shed, like dandruff or, um, or dirt, uh, every time we uh, move through any digital environment. The profile thus exists at the crossing of alienability versus inalienability of one, one's own image as property. In other words, what cannot be taken from me? What is inalienable with regard to my image? And what is alienable? What can be taken from me in terms of my image? This question of what is inalienable versus what is alienable is at the heart of um, questions of freedom. Uh, and uh, agency in politics and beyond. Etienne Balibar is a person who's theorized this condition um, really helpfully. He traces the relationship between person and property to the origins of modern political theory. He writes, quote, in Locke, property in oneself must be at once a process of alienation and a manifestation of the inalienable the infinite expenditure of the subject into the economy of properties and a return or retreat of the subject into the inalienable or identity. So we have to be able to sell ourselves, as it were, put ourselves into the world, but also there must be something that can't be sold, that we can't give over. Since the possession of oneself, the inalienable right to one's person, is the root of political freedom, Understanding such a reading um, is essential, uh, such a reading, pardon me, is essential to understanding um, the locus of struggle in modern politics. Is inalienability of oneself freedom? Or, as Foucault argues in another context from the one I've already developed in, in his 1979 essay on neoliberalism where he argued that everyone must be an entrepreneur of himself, is the capacity to alienate oneself, to give over oneself as property, in fact, the principle of freedom? These are questions which I want to, which I believe have been deeply explored by a number of artists working in the kind of realm that we're discussing here, that Melanie has charted out through the Lunch Bites discussions. I'm going to talk about two tonight um, and to try to think through this question of the inalienable versus the alienable, how does one own one's property as freedom, and what the plasticity of information is. The first of these works is one by Artie Vierkant, who's already come up, um, called Antoine Office, Antoine Casual. Um, and I'm showing you uh, a slide of the front and back, or, or I don't think there's really a front and the back, of both of the sides of this work, which are basically two very large monitors mounted together 
On the left is the side that corresponds to Anton Office, and on the right, Anton Casual. Um, he, the artist, um, Artie Vierkant, bought a full body scan of this person, Antoine, for $150 on, um, on this website, TurboSquid. And, and he found that there was Antoine Office and Antoine Casual. Um, but he wanted to animate Antoine, as I'll show you a uh, documentation of the video in a second. He wanted to animate him, but because his hands are in his pockets, no, um, you can't actually get his hands to do anything. Um, so he, in fact, um, found the person who made the 3D scan, who was in Amsterdam, sort of a connection to, the, um, to this, maybe. Um, and, and scanned him again um, so that he could then um, alienate his body a second time through various motions, which you'll see in a moment. Here you can buy 15 terrorist motions for just $10 um, on the same website. Um, when, I, uh, when I asked Artie about this work, um, he wrote me an email which include the following very interesting statements, which I want to share with you. Um, actually, no, I'll, that's fine. I'll stick with this uh, image. When I interviewed Antoine about the process and what he felt about it, um, and this is, he, he told Antoine in vague sense that he was going to animate his image. So he, he disclosed what he was doing, but, you know, in a slightly vague way. Um, so when, when I interviewed Antoine about the process and what he felt about it, his sole stipulation was that his image not be used for anything lewd. And after this statement, he proceeded to tell me that anyway, even though I had the scan, it was his image. So he had, in his estimation, a right to myself in case at any time he wanted to take it back and disallow me from using it. I think some of this comes, this is still Artie talking, I think some of this comes from a particularly European sentiment on what are called personality rights or the right of publicity. Since in the United States, we are often more inclined, for instance, to place authorship and ownership in the photographer rather than the subject. Here, I'm gonna show you, um, oh actually, this isn't from the beginning. This will give you a sense. Now, just to remind you, um, this is recto and verso. So this is a documentation. The work, you would not see them side by side, but on opposite sides, as I showed you in the slide. Now, this, I would argue that this is the behavior not of a human being, Antoine, but the behavior of a profile. This is how a profile acts. So what kind of rights to an image or freedom um, does this man, does this person um, have? From a certain perspective, as I mentioned, maximum alienability um, understood as the capacity to circulate one's image as an image could be understood as freedom. But if one has lost one's agency to that image, as Antoine has done, despite the fact that he believes he can reclaim it at any point, um, then such alienability would be the epitome of unfreedom. So, what I want to argue, and I'll be arguing this with regard to both this work and also the work of Hito Steirel that I'll end with, is that, and, that instead of this being about alienability or inalienability, that what happens is Antoine becomes a kind of alien. He looks like an automaton, as though in the American film Invasion of the Body Snatchers, some other force had entered into the um, the body. Now for Balibar, this condition is a dire one. It's the loss of freedom. He writes, the autonomization, autonomization of knowledge beyond individual intelligence, in other words, if we no longer have control of our own image, I would paraphrase, it's an inexact paraphrase, but I think it's fair enough. Um, 
the autonomization of knowledge beyond individual intelligence and beyond the figure of the intellectual is the opening of a potential crisis of any possibility for the individual or the collective to be represented as the proprietor of something or itself. Here what we have is a dissolution of the political individual. So Balibar would argue that the alien, and certainly I'm using this term advisedly to think about illegal aliens, um, people who migrate or emigrate illegally without citizen rights, um, in fact, are those without freedom. But there's another way of seeing this. Um, the equation, let me first move back. There's another way of seeing this. Um, the equation between representation and freedom, which is in a way what Balibar is saying, um, has a long tradition in identity politics and is best exemplified in recent philosophical thought by Ranciere, um, whose notion of uh, becoming political has to do with becoming visible. So here is the problem. If infinite alienability, the, the infinite capacity to become visible um, is unfreedom, how can it also be the claim for politics, the claim for identity. I think that um, Hito Steiro gives us the other side of this question, and that is how freedom can be a search for invisibility, for evading vision um, in, a certain, in a certain way, for, as it were, refusing one's status as a profile. Um, here is uh, one um, screen grab from her film, her, her video, um, How Not to Be Seen, a fucking didactic educational .mov file from 2013, where, um, which is based um, on how-to videos and YouTube and um, a kind of, uh, well, it's not at all DIY, but it has a sort of DIY dimension of do-it-yourself um, that is of um, instructing people on how to disappear. Um, it certainly alludes to the ethos of the dark net of cryptocurrencies, etc. But I want to focus, um, draw one point from this very complex work, which I hope some of you have seen, which is um, that Styrel makes a very interesting argument about two different um, registers of images, what I've been calling two different ki kinds of image plasticity. One is the analog registration. Um, this is called a resolution target. It's um, used to focus cameras. And um, in the desert above California in the 50s and 60s, as Styro recounts in, the, in, her, in her film, um, these were placed on the ground in order for um, aerial photographs, surveillance photographs, to focus themselves. Of course, they're now decommissioned because um, cameras use pixels instead of um, analog uh, focus. And in the course of the video, she makes a very interesting point that in 1996, a pixel on the Earth from you know, satellite photographs was 12 meters square, whereas today a pixel corresponds to one foot. So her, the conceit in this work is that what one needs to do to disappear is to somehow move through the cracks of these different levels of resolution. You have to be smaller than a pixel, or you have to somehow evade one form of resolution in order to um, play upon it. In a recent lecture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Styro stated, um, and this is a paraphrase uh, from my notes, um, that she wanted to show how digital creatures escape and use the military resolution scale as a kind of dance floor. And here is another screen grab where uh, the band Three Degrees, or the, the group Three Degrees is playing their song, When Will I See You Again, dancing um, in, on a green, projected on a green screen with the resolution 
target underneath them as a kind of dance floor. So into the question of the inalienable and the alienable is here introduced again the figure of the alien, of the little green man. This, by the way, just so that there's no misunderstanding, the alien here is not part of, that's my superimposition onto this screen grab, just so that you don't think that such a grotesquely um, crude effect would have come from, from Ida Stiral's hand. Um, in, in English, little green men are in fact um, a term for aliens, but I think probably these green men are the kinds of aliens that come out of green screens, which, um, where one can disappear by becoming uh, a screen of projection. What makes images aliens in Styrel's sense is their capacity to lodge in the gaps between distinct regimes of information plasticity. In other words, agency occurs in the, in the space between different image registers. She, in the work, and I won't go into this in detail, but it's important to realize that in her work, several different um, species of animation occur. You can see that there is an image of this desert landscape. The green screen includes an image of a rendering of a gated community into which um, the, the group of singers you can see under that pavilion is introduced, and um, the bird, the whited out or profiled birds flying uh, that you can see on the left of the screen. These different um, genres of image move at different speeds, at different resolutions, and different material substrates. Just as Hans Hacke created a finance map or a finance territory over a real estate territory, here are several um, territories of information that are um, inexactly superimposed upon one another. This kind of what one might call arbitrage or speculation between different modes of representation, um, sorry, uh, shoot, is in fact um, exactly what uh, Snowden was operating in. He acted in the cracks between different regimens of knowledge, between his access as an NSA employee, the dark net, the press, the World Wide Web, et cetera, and all of this forced him too to be an alien a man without a country, and here is just um, earlier in the month a story about um, his desire to have asylum in Switzerland. So the alien is he or she who works between image networks or information networks. But in putting the NSA disclosure on the web, Snowden ensured that this information would always be available. In a sense, one could say that this is inalienable information because it is so, access to it is completely open, um, anyone with a computer. So the Snowden case exemplifies a new pa paradigm where alienability need not any longer be associated with a diminishment of freedom. The only inalienable property we now have, one could argue, is the property that's so widely distributed that access will never be threatened to it. Freedom, then, is the capacity to assemble alien networks. And in order to accomplish this, the question we must address is access, not property. Thank you very much. <laughs>